Given the fact that this Earth appears to be the only inhabitable planet in the solar system, would ET spacecraft visitation be evidence that interstellar travel or warp drive, things like that, can be made practical? Is the current political and social landscape having a positive or negative impact on research and disclosure? Um, neither, really. Uh, I think people think this is a political issue, but I don't really think it is. I think most politicians want to stay far away from it until they have to be involved. Probably a politically smart thing to do. Um, I don't blame them necessarily. Uh, but we're past that. And it's been my experience uh, before and my experience now that it is absolutely a bipartisan issue. And no one seems to be making this a political issue, thank thankfully. Um, the individuals that I have been, been fortunate enough to, to, to be exposed to in, in, in our level, the higher levels of government, every single one of them has taken this stone cold serious. And for me, that's, that's, that's encouraging. I mean, that means that our government is, is, starting, is trying to work. Um, it's, it's listening, and it's not scoffing. And, and it's not one or two, it's started off with four or five, became seven, became nine, and now you've got a lot of people involved. Um, so that's great news. Given how we have identified numerous Earth-like planets, exoplanets nearby, has anyone ever attempted to track craft trajectories to exoplanets, which we then can point our telescopes and SETI towards? ATIP did not. Um, we were too focused on the here and now. Um, it was more uh, as to what are these things doing in our operational environments? And are they a threat to our military capabilities? And what are their capabilities? That's, that was our focus. Why, in your opinion, has the public lost interest in, gen in general with the space race? Why haven't we not been back to the moon for years? Pure conjecture on my part. I think uh, for the last decade and a half, we've been uh, a society that's been been pretty distracted. Uh, we've been distracted with um, global issues, whether it be terrorism, whether it be wars and conflict, whether it be climate change, whether it be whatever issue du jour we've been dealing with. But these issues uh, require a lot of money, and they are uh, they don't they don't lend themselves to being distracted by outside things. And so when you talk about the UAP quote unquote threat, well, at the end of the day, you have to determine to yourself what's more of a threat, North Korea with nuclear capabilities and ISIS or UAPs. And there's only so much money, so much resources to go around. So, so until you tell me a UAP has just blown up one of my aircraft carriers, you know what? That's not my priority. That's my priority. And so I understand that from a military perspective, that makes sense. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't think this is like a conversation about fine wine that gets better the longer you leave a cork in it. I, I, think, I think we need to have the conversation now. I think yesterday. Um, but, I, but I do understand from, from that corporate perspective why maybe this is not, why we haven't been into another space race, so to speak. Um, it's just not a national priority. But at the end of the day, if it's not a national priority, it's because you didn't make it a national priority. And yes, I'm putting that on your shoulder squarely. Because you are the people. You are the ones who elect officials. You are the ones that set what the priority should be. And so, if you're not doing it, then somebody else will do it for you. So, if you want this to be a national priority, then you have to engage your elected officials. That's what they're there for. And tell them you want this to be a priority. And give them briefings. And give them data. And then it becomes a national priority. And I'll go out on a limb here. I think it's becoming one again. I think we're getting there. Convincing scientists that these crafts are real is of paramount importance to progress. 
What information can be disclosed? What type of data that will convince and enlist the scientific community? You know, it's funny when you when you talk to a scientist when when you <laughs> you get a couple whiskeys in him or her and, and have a serious conversation. And a lot of times they'll they'll tell you, you know, it's funny. My my mom told me a story growing up that that she saw a UFO or you know what I saw something once. I was on a desert road and. You know, I just can't explain it. So, you know, I, I think scientists are, are people like everybody else. Uh, I think they are subject to peer pressure. I think they're subject to ridicule. I think they're subject to, to budgets. Nobody wants to lose your funding. Nobody wants to, you know, I mean, come on, we all got mortgages to pay. So, so I get it. Uh, and so, unfortunately, a lot of the scientists that are involved in this, they do it on, they do it on the down low because it's considered fringe. It's taboo, right? Um, so the question is, how do we break that taboo? How do we, we break that stigma so scientists can, can I mean, look, the, the, Katie, you're sitting here with a guy who ran this, the, the, the psychic program for the U.S. government. I mean, I don't know how more taboo that gets. And yet it was real, and he got it off the ground, and it was running, and it was successful. Now, you call it something fancy like remote viewing, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty interesting stuff. You, you're using human cognitive capabilities to collect espionage on a foreign country separated by space and time. I mean, if that's not wild science, I don't know what it is, right? And yet he succeeded. And he, he is a real scientist. He is one of the best of the best. So, so if you want to know how you crack that code, that's the guy you talk to. Because I'm not a scientist. I'm just a, an old gumshoe investigator. He's the guy who did it. And he did it again and again and again. He's got a track record of doing that, of breaking taboos, breaking barriers, and making programs that, by the way, have kept this country safe for a very long time. So my suggestion is you be out, you should ask him. Can you speak about the NORAD intercept data that happens on a regular basis? I cannot. Have the preliminary results of your recent materials analyses supported or challenged your theories on the physics behind the phenomenon? Supported on the physics, but some of the material, like I said, has turned out, it looks like, to be fairly ordinary. So the, it's really, we're talking about the, 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 the minority of material that is truly extraordinary. And that has reinforced um, the, the opinions of, of and the conclusions so far that we have. Is any of your focus on the occupants of the UFPs? When you say you, me, or you, TTSA, or you, ATIP? Is any of your focus on the occupants of the UAP? Who asked that question? Can you tell me if that related to what? A tip, T T S A, or what? It, uh, that would be more towards both A tip and T T S A and what they're doing now. A tip, um, to a limited degree. Um, yeah, to a limited degree early on. Um, T T S A. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. We want to cast a wide net. We want to catch as many fish as we can. So you cast a really, really wide net. Now you're going to reel in a lot of minnows. We got it. But you also may, may, may get some, some sizable fish there that you want to keep. So that's been our, that's been our strategy. Have we attempted to shoot down any AAP? Have we succeeded? Have we recovered any tech or beings dead or alive? Out of curiosity, did, did the ATIP program look at or consider any of the stuff that like maybe Len Stringville did with the crash retrievals or look into any of those crashes? Okay. okay. Um, notionally or explicitly, did, have you, you know, has anybody studied the physical or psychological effects on observers? Yep. There's actually... Uh, some very qualified individuals in the medical field. Um, I can't comment on what they're doing and what they have done, but uh, these are extremely professional individuals who have the qualifications, expertise, and the, the vitae to, 
to answer that question. Uh, and they're looking at it. Um, so is there anything known about the pilots, biological or autonomous of these craft? Is there anything known about the uh, pilots themselves, I guess, of these craft? At this point, I wouldn't want to assume anything. I, I don't want to say there's pilots, uh, are they UAVs, are they manned, or any combination in between. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not prepared to go there at, at this point. I think it's too premature. I think we, we, we need more data. We're getting down there. I was invited to the first NASA Techno Signatures workshop in Houston in October 2018. The SETI folks are not on board with looking for UFOs. Despite efforts to locate alien artifacts on the moon and asteroids, how can we get SETI and NASA on board? So let me respectfully agree to disagree on one note, to say that there's alien artifacts on the moon and Mars. Um, uh, I'm not convinced of that. Uh, I understand people feel that way, and I respect their feelings, um, but I haven't seen any empirical data to substantiate that, um, other than a couple folks, you know, on a couple sites saying something, saying that. So I haven't seen anything through government government channels to, to substantiate that. Um, but to the bigger note, as far as what SETI is doing, um, you know, SETI has a mission, and they're using the tools that they have to do their mission. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, like I said, I think it's a three, three prong approach. You know, if, you, if you're going to try to, if you want to try to, to catch a butterfly uh, with, with, or a fly with chopsticks, it might be kind of tough, right? Um, but then again, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to catch something else, a mouse, maybe, maybe it works. So. Uh, I think I think there is use for SETI. I think it's a it's a great mission. Um, I, I I'm a little disappointed that that when we came out they were they were viscerally opposed to what we we're trying to do because at the end of the day we're doing the exact same thing they are. We're using the scientific approach with the means and capabilities that we have to look at something that we don't understand. With by the way a hell of a lot more evidence. There's no speculation on this. This is real. It's there. I mean we, we got it. So. Um, the question is what it is, we don't know, but it, it is there. I mean, that's, we're beyond that. That, that, that horse has left the gate, it's gone. Um, so why would people be opposed to trying to figure that out? I don't know, other than maybe we're getting into their rice bowls. Uh, but I, I, I think there's a, I think, I think SETI's mission is a, is a real mission, and I think it's warranted, and I think we should spend money on it, if you ask me personally. I think, it, I think it's a good mission. Um, these are like, okay, so uh, can, you, can you talk about the directed energy weapon capabilities of the U.S. government and whether they're being used on U.S. citizens? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. I, I can't address that, but I can tell you most certainly they're not being used on U.S. citizens. I, folks, I hate, to, I hate to disappoint you. Um, that is absolutely not a crime. That's great news. So, <laughs> you can rest easy. They're, they're, they're not using directed energy weapons at you. Um, but that's all I can say about that. Are you aware of any geoengineering programs? Has anyone been able to translate symbols that may be an extraterrestrial language? I, I don't have the expertise to answer that. Um, that wasn't our focus. What, in your opinion, is the best way to sift and sort through mountains of hoaxes and mistakes to find truly inexplicable AAP data? Data, data, data. Put everything in, even junk. If you make the machine, the sausage machine good enough, all the junk will, 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 will get thrown out. Um, that's why you have AI. That's why we're building our vault, our virtual analytic UAP learning tool, and that's why we have the Atom Project. It is a very, very expensive effort. It is not cheap. But if you do it right, the analytics will sift through everything and hopefully separate the chaff from the wheat. And so that is why we are endeavoring on, on that effort, because we believe it's important enough. So how do you do that? Well, you hire the best of the best from places like Google and Sony to come out and help you with the AI. 
and that AI will be able to identify patterns that us as human beings aren't able to do. And that's going to be fielded. That's going to be something you're going to be able to access from your computer, your iPhone. So this is going to be data you're going to be able to pull up anytime and do whatever the hell you want to do with it, um, which I think is fascinating. I think that's great. So that's something that we're trying to do. And, and again, to answer your question succinctly, I know I've been kind of yammering, but it's all about the algorithms that go on behind the scenes. Um, and you have to teach the system how to recognize what is legitimate and what is not. And it's not going to be done on a singular basis. It has to be a, a basically look at all the data and then come up with the, the, the necessary AI protocol to say, actually, that is something very significant or that is not. And you're not going to be able to do that until you have the complete picture. So again, data, data, data. Give it to me. Give it. To, I don't care if it's junk. I don't care. I want real. I want junk and everything in between. Because we will sort it out. Um, where did the material come from that you're talking about and you showed? Uh, and when can you discuss this? It will be discussed very soon. Um, again, stay tuned. And by the way, this is not a cheap plug for the show. If you don't watch it, that's fine. Uh, it's just to let you know that all these questions that you're asking, we tried to anticipate seven months ago. So that's what we built into this thing. We didn't, we're not doing this show just to go out and, and you know have a, a bunch of pyrotechnics and say, wow, here is a cool show. This is not a UFO hunting show. That's not what this is. This is a docuseries. These are real people in uniform, active duty, telling you what's going on. And we address those questions. So you want to know? Watch it. And by the way, if you handle, I'm not an actor. I tell you, I got a face like a cement truck. Nobody wants to see me on camera. I get it. But it just so happens that we're working with the right people that, that can give you the information you're looking for. So when you look at the show, look at it from the perspective that, that what I'm telling you here, this is your show. This is not our show. This is your show. This is the show that all those questions you've been asking from day one, since that article, all those articles came out, that's in the show. And stuff you've never heard about, never seen before, you're gonna say, wow, holy smokes, I had no idea. And that's the purpose. And then that's gonna get you to force Congress and ask questions, more questions. And so that's, that's how this works. We're getting down there, sir. I'm gonna let you go here. Uh, have the, has the government program that created the software to track UAPs, track the Puerto Rico 2013 UAP to a destination inside the island? Nope, can't answer. Okay, uh, has it been easier to get government to listen than the scientific community? Yes and no. Um, the government, look, at the end of the day, if the government doesn't want to do anything with this, it's because we've made it a statement. We've made it such a, a, a pain in their ass, excuse my language, that they don't want to deal with it until you tell them it's okay to deal with it. Once they knew, you know you, Joe Public, tell them, we want you to look at this, then they will. And so that's what we're in the process of doing. And it's kind of a push-pull effort. So uh, if, if you want them to look at it, you got to let them know it's okay to look at it. Because every time they look at it, what happens? People ridicule them. Ah, the government's wasting money on ATIP, and they spent $22 million on 37 studies that didn't mean anything. Well, that's absolutely not true, but that's what happens. And so no wonder no government bureaucrat, GS 13, 14, or 15, wants to even address this. Because it's, it's radioactive. It's kryptonite. It's a career ender. So once Congress says, you will look at this, and once you tell Congress, this is your priority, then that stigma's gone. So it, it's not an easy question because you're saying does government or scientific community, which one is, is, is more repulsed by, by the topic? Um, in some cases, it's both. And in some cases, it's neither. I mean, look at you all here. We've got a lot of scientists here, a lot. I mean, folks that have, have active jobs right now with DOD. So, so it's happening. At the same time, it's happening with government. Could TTSA patent the processes or the pro processes observed in the UAP material? Then in that case, it might not be best to reveal the analysis results. Sure, yeah, you're right. But the material that's not ours, 
um, that, that we are stewards of is, again, not ours. So we're not gonna patent something that doesn't belong to us. Um, some of these individuals have been very generous uh, and patient with us and have allowed us to analyze their material, uh, allowed us to serve as stewards of their material, provided we provide that information back to them. But it is, at the end of the day, their material. So if you come up to me after the end of the show and say, uh, hey, Lou, I got something here. I want you guys to look at it. It's really interesting. That's your material. That's not ours. I can't go out and patent that thing. And in order for me to do touch this thing, I need your permission every step of the way. And then when you say, Lou, I want it back, there you go, all yours. So that's kind of our approach with TTSA. It's important that, that people can trust us. It's important that people know that we're, we're honest brokers uh, and we're not just out there to try to exploit uh, a situation. What percent of ATIP's work was UFO related? What percent was roughly the program paperwork and the Pentagon says it was uh, looking for foreign aerospace advancements in the years to 30 to 50 years from now, many people are claiming that ATIP was 100% a UFO program. ATIP was a 100% UFO program, period. It's not looking at airplanes. So, um, I don't know what to tell you. you know, I, I think it's starting to come out now when you start looking at, at the list of studies that came out. Um, but it was a UFO program. You call it UAP, UAS, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Tomatoes, tomatoes, Ford Mercury. It was a UFO. Um, but I couldn't be the one to say that. It had to be DIA. And so there had to be Senator Reid or some of these people that, that can say that. Again, it just can't be world according to Lou. It, it's, not, it's not helpful. So, so um, as far as our time spent on it, when you were working ATIP, it was ATIP. It wasn't anything else but ATIP. But a lot of us also had other jobs too. So, I mean, to, in all fairness, it wasn't that it was ATIP 100% of the time. But when it was ATIP, it was 100% of the time, if that makes sense. Realistically, what is the first major technological advancement that we can expect to see, providing no obstacles get in the way? Provided no obstacles, I'd say beamed energy propulsion and quantum communication. What can you tell us about Medvedev's statement to Sky News in 2012 that he was given the folder on relations with aliens when he took office? Not a clue. You're doing well. Given the fact that this Earth appears to be the only inhabitable planet in the solar system, would ET spacecraft visitation be evidence that interstellar travel or warp drive, things like that, can be made practical? Well, let's look at the definition of habitable. From our perspective, sure. But I will tell you from other perspectives, maybe not. Okay, we talk about the Goldilocks zone. But we know there are already on this planet extremophiles. We know there are bacteria that grow a mile below the Arctic ice in extreme pressures and darkness. We know that there's animals that live in the deepest parts of the Mariana Trench and Challenger Deep living off the chemo chemo chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis, basically surviving off the chemicals from, from the black smokers down below. And environments that we could never survive in. So for us, we look and say, well, nothing could ever survive on those planets. Those are extreme environments. Well. Not if they're designed for it, not if they're for adapted for it. You know, you take a, a you go deep sea fishing and you, you catch some of these fish that live two, three thousand feet below the below the surface, you bring them up and they don't survive more than a couple minutes because there's not enough pressure. For them, this is an extreme environment. So I think it's important that we keep that in mind. What we consider habitable and not habitable, that's relative. Because quite frankly, if I jump in a pond and I go more than two inches below the water, I'm not gonna be in a habitable zone for very long. So, unless I have scuba gear. So, I think that's relative. Um, as far as any possibility that something from the outside would be coming in here, I don't want to speculate because I've said before, I don't know if it's from outer space, inner space, or the space in between. It could be anything. It might, it might be from here. It might just be a completely different paradigm than we're used to or everyone was aware of. Uh, where, where the experience of space-time itself is fundamentally different. Where we, look, we live in a three-dimensional world, and we have a function of, of, of time as a fourth dimension. Is it conceivable that maybe there's a species that can live in that construct of four dimensions all the time? So what I mean, like in practical sense, instead of me being here right now with you, I could be here right now five minutes from now or five minutes ago. 
and I have that flexibility where time itself is a, is a movable dimension. So I, I, think, I think there's lots of things that could be, and I don't want to speculate what could be because all we know is what is, and that is the data that we're collecting. So that's why I stay focused to the data. I, I, I really don't want to speculate because we don't really know. Can you provide any information on which government agencies or departments to FOIA for data relating to ATIP, including any reports produced? And did you have any responsibility for allocating financial resources in regard to ATIP or OSAP, assuming financial resources were available? Um, let me focus on the one question. As far as, um, I want to get this straight. Can you, can, let me read this. Can you provide any, can you provide any information on which agencies, so on which agencies for the FOIA. Um, if you look at Senator Reed's letter on the very last page, look at the very bottom page and you're gonna see FOIA exempt language. Okay, that's real. Now you can say, oh that's sneaky, they shouldn't put it there, but we do, for a reason. Some of that stuff is FOIA exempt and you're not gonna see it. I don't know what to tell you. Um, and it's for exempt for a reason. And there's exceptions by law. There are, there are, when you look at those exemptions, they actually go back to very, very specific things, loopholes, if you will, or circumstances that something is not foiable because of sensitivities, because of sources and methods, because all sorts of reasons. Um, and so from that perspective, some of the frustration people, first of all, they, they thought it was advanced aviation, so you're not gonna get anything. So, I mean, for the six months I was telling people, right aerospace, um, that's one thing. So you have to be very, very specific when you do a FOIA, and you also need to know which offices. So uh, DIA, DOD is a big organization. So you may not get everything you want. It's not a magic bullet. You have to, you have to continue to keep pushing, you keep pushing, and and digging and finding out what offices were around, and what offices were not, and then maybe apply those specifically, those magic bullet FOIAs to those specific offices. OSAP was indeed the predecessor to ATIP. We, we made that very clear from day one. Unfortunately, I can't talk much about it out of respect for my former colleagues. I won't do it. It's, if, if you wanna know more about OSAP and what they were doing, you're gonna have to talk to the former director. Until, unless or until he gives me permission to mention it, I can't do it. It's just out of respect for him. It's a promise I made him long, long ago. And just like I wouldn't want anyone speaking on my behalf, which apparently people do all the time, but that, that's, uh, ask me and I'll tell you. Um, so with all due respect, I, I, I really can't answer too much about the all-sap piece.